Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. Uh, this episode is good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, uh, no Alberta accident and sickness credits, and no IROC credits for this episode. Uh, we've got to pair back on the IROC credits because I've blown the budget. They're very expensive to get. So um, if no IROC credits is a concern for you, please let me know uh, because I can use that as a case to maybe get that budget bumped up. So then also Advocus and FP Canada, this would be an, a financial planning credit for FP Canada. Okay, uh, Fiona and I go long in this episode. We talked for just a little over an hour, so I'll be quick with all my preliminaries. Um, just a really great primer here on family law and Fiona knows her stuff well and you can hear especially in the last half of the episode where she gets into some of the finer points where I really uh, got to learn a lot. Uh, the object for today's episode is a globe. Okay, I travel a fair bit. My wife and I both good travelers. And as a result, the globe is important to me and it normally sits right about there. All right, let's get on with the interview. I'm joined today by Fiona McLean. Fiona is a lawyer practicing in Calgary and uh, like me, ex-military, which is, I think, ex- you have that right? I am X now, yes. Yeah, okay, which is where we originally met a long time ago. Um, so Fiona, I hope you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Sure. Um, firstly, thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, as Jason mentioned, I'm Fiona McLean, and I've been a lawyer in Calgary since 1993. I operate my own firm. We're in the West End of downtown called McLean Legal. And primarily I practice in family law and real estate, although I do do some minor civil litigation matters and rules and estates. I happen to be fortunate to have been appointed a Queen's Council in March of last year. And in terms of my committee work and community involvement, I am a member of the Legal Aid Appeals Committee. I'm also assessor for our provincial bar exam. And I'm on two community boards of directors, one for the Calgary Military Family Resource Center and Ballard Canada. And in addition to, as you mentioned, I'm now a former military reservist with over 32 years of service. I, I didn't catch the last board, Fiona, sorry. What was the last one? Well, it's uh, Ballard Canada. So it deals with educating Canadians about their Canadian military heritage. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I still have some involvement in doing that, although I was not aware of Valor Canada, so that's interesting. Yeah, very good initiative. You'll see a lot of our YouTube videos online. Okay, I'm going to check it out then, because I, I probably have seen something, but not made the connection, so yeah, that's good. Um, now, can we, uh, I guess, delve right into the uh, finer points of family law here, which is why I brought you on today? Absolutely. Ask your questions. That's the way. Yeah, perfect. So can you start us off and you and I are in Alberta, which of course is a little bit different from other, maybe a lot different, I don't know, from other provinces. But can you run down marriage, common law relationships, adult interdependent partnerships, separation and divorce, and how these things all kind of look in, a, in the, let's say, legal framework? Sure. Um, really what we're talking about is different kinds of relationships that parties enter into themselves. So marriage, the common one we're all aware of, is two people who undertake an official marriage ceremony, either in a church or in a civil proceeding, and then subsequently register that marriage with the province. Common law starts when two people start living together and hold themselves out as a couple to the public. Now, I hear a lot of people who say to me, well, I'm common law after six months. I really honestly don't know where they get that from, perhaps TV. But the clock starts ticking on common law from day one when you start moving in together, okay? It's really a question there on afterwards how much uh, property division or entitlements you might have, and those kind of grow over time. An adult interdependent partner is something kind of unique to Alberta. So it's those people who have been in a position of interdependence with one another for a period of more than three years. So we say three years plus a day, okay? So those kind of people could be common law couples in an intimate relationship. They could be a parent or parents and an adult child. They could be a person looking after someone with disabilities. They could be somebody who enters into an agreement to say that we're adult interdependent partners. Or uh, the exception to the rule of the three years is that somebody who has a child while they're together. 
They might have been together for one year or two years, but they have a child. They're going to be called an adult interdependent partner. So those are the type of relationships that we have. When we talk about separation, that is really when two people officially decide or unofficially decide that they're no longer going to be remaining in a relationship of any kind and wish to move forward with the lives independent from one another. And I say unofficial, unofficial, depending on whether you have a legal separation document, which we'll get into later. Yes. And divorce is when formerly married couples have suffered a breakdown of marriage and obtain a certificate of divorce dissolving their marriage. And you can get a divorce on three reasons in Canada. One is the easy one year separation. One is adultery, a little harder to prove. And one is mental or physical cruelty or both. So those are kind of the distinctions. They're all about relationships. Do you actually see divorces proceed on the basis of cruelty or adultery or is everything you ever see just the one year? Mostly people will claim one year or one year with some form of cruelty, but they'll actually process it on the basis of one year. In my entire years of practice, I've only ever done one adultery divorce because it is really hard to do. I think that's the whole private investigator following somebody around kind of well, thing. Well, most people don't have enough money for that, actually. It's uh, taking a lot of information from social media because adultery is a circumstantial case. When you're proving adultery, you don't have to definitively prove adultery and have the video you know, of them doing the deed. But there's a lot of stuff people these days put on social media and we glean that to determine that they have a relationship or they've had an intimate relationship with somebody else and we can get a divorce on the basis of adultery. Wow, that seems, I mean, that seems like a pretty uh, extreme step, but at the same time, the stuff people will put on Facebook, right? Yeah, it, and the case that I did have was a bit like reading a, a trashy novel, to be honest. <laughs> So I prefer to actually do the divorces on the basis of one year. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure that that's much, like you said, much cleaner and simpler. It is for sure. Yeah. It is. Now that's a good breakdown of sort of like family law 101. You know, we, we're talking here mostly to financial advisors and financial planners. Correct. And one of the areas that I know I get a lot of questions about in class is about the need for, I'm going to use the word prenup here. I'm sure you'll correct my language around that. But when do people need prenups? Do they work? Is it worth doing them? Can you talk a little bit through the, the whole prenup uh, case? Sure. Um, there are a number of reasons why people might have a prenuptial agreement. Uh, one is income disparity of the parties, which you'll see as financial planners. So someone has a high net worth and they're worried about the possibility of some portion of that going to a partner on separation or divorce. The other one is estate planning. Um, someone may wish to ensure that family assets can be distributed to beneficiaries again without some portion being distributed to a, a partner. And then subsequent relationships. Maybe these people, it's not their first rodeo. It's they've gone through the whole divorce thing. It's been terrible, horrible kind of situation for them. They wanna make sure it doesn't happen again. So they wanna make sure that the assets they come into this relationship with remain theirs and any that they gain together will be shared. So that's some of the reasons why they do it. We don't tend to do a ton of prenups in my practice. We tend to do more cohabitation agreements that eventually might roll in and become a prenuptial because people are not sure these days if they wanna get married. And many, many people don't in fact. So that common law type of cohabitation agreement is really what I do more of, to be honest. We do the same things, though, to be true, that we would do in a prenuptial agreement, cover off the same kind of bases uh, as somebody who might contemplate getting into a marriage relationship. But um, are they successful in getting it done when people come and see me? Well, I'd say probably between a third and half of the time getting it done, because the real barrier to getting a prenuptial agreement completed is the emotional component to it rather than discuss practicalities of it between two people, there are allegations of you don't trust me, there's a lack of trust, right? And accusing the other of dooming the relationship to failure before it's even started. So I find a lot of people back off from wanting to get a prenuptial when faced with a partner, it becomes so upset over the concept of having one in the first place 
that they either decide they're going to get out of that relationship or they're going to go ahead with that relationship and hope for the best. So some clients have completely walked away because the other person simply won't sign. That seems like a pretty harsh step, but I suppose if you're if your financial outcomes are important to you, then your financial outcomes are important to you, right? They are, but you have to remember as well, you're often dealing with a partner who is not business savvy, who hasn't been out in the world, has a different kind of life experience. So rather than look at it from, let me say, the more logical side of things, they tend to go too far on the emotional end of things. And that, that kind of dooms the relationship from the start almost. It's a fair point, you know, this whole question about getting into a relationship with somebody where you don't necessarily share, let's say financial values. I think mm -hmm. that that's probably a, a big thing you see in your practice in those conversations with clients. Um, I, I do when I'm doing the divorces because that's often when one partner will find out that the other partner has five or six credit cards they didn't know about. And uh, it's a shocker to get through all that at the end of the day. Yeah, I uh, that's something we talk about in class a fair bit. It's not unusual at all that we have, you know, I have, Back two weeks ago, I had this class where we talk about credit card debt. And I always ask, what's the largest amount of credit card debt you've seen one client carry? And uh, in a class of 20 students, it's usually in the low six figures, like 110, 120. And then the question about, is it disclosed to the spouse, right? Well, the thing that I see more than credit card debt actually these days is line of credit debt because that's uh, increasing more and more as a financing mechanism. And so people have their mortgage, plus they have their line of credit that's secured, plus they have maybe one or two unsecured lines of credit. And these things get maxed out because they're much higher than your credit limits often on your credit cards. Now, just circling back to the cohabitation agreement, Fiona, so mm. you said you, you normally do a cohab sort of when somebody assume like before they move in together or something like that. Is it do people have the instinct that they need this and they call you or do they hear this from an advisor? What do you think brings people to you with that question? I think they hear about it from a friend, quite honestly. I don't know yet if the financial advisors know to suggest that they should go and get some legal advice about that. And I suppose that's one of the things to convey to everybody here today is that there are some questions to simply ask your client about, have you considered this? Or have you considered that? Before you take that step, perhaps you want to go and consult with a lawyer and get some legal advice. But mostly the clients that I see, they've heard it from a friend or they thought, oh, well, I'm going to move in with somebody. What does that mean? You know, and I get that question I raised earlier. Are, am I a, a common law after six months? So do I have like a six month reprieve before, you know, things start to happen and I have to correct their, their information or their misinformation, I should say, about the law? So can you just run down a little bit what, and you said, I know that the obligations increase as you spend more time together and sort of as the relationship gets deeper, let's say, but in Alberta today anyways, can you run down roughly what happens at the end of a, let's say, a, a fairly long-term common law relationship? Sure. Um, from a property perspective, and, and this is one of the things I, I think you were going to ask me or later in, in the podcast, but um, we actually changed the Matrimonial Property Act to the Family Property Act. So in Alberta, we're starting to blur the distinction between common law persons and married persons and what their entitlements are. So if you're an adult interdependent partner, you've got three years plus a day, and you could be anywhere from, you know, who knows, three years to 30 years together, common law, and you split, okay? You're going to be entitled to 50% as a starting point of the discussion of any of the property that's generated during the course of that relationship, okay? And there are some exceptions to that in the legislation, but that's your starting point. You don't have to prove an entitlement to get to 50, you start at 50%. Whereas when you're under three years, you're going from zero to 50% to prove an entitlement, okay? So the onus is on you to prove the entitlement, to try and prove the percentage of the claim that you would have against your former partner. That's helpful, thanks, yeah. I didn't really know about the sort of graduated increase as you get closer to three years. I thought it was like a switch off and on at three years. So. No, I mean, we had um, uh, a case many years ago out of the Supreme Court of Canada, and they basically said, if you chose not to get married, 
then you can't avail yourself of the entitlements that married people have to property. And that's where the graduated scale came from. Alberta just considers it so cumbersome to prove an entitlement between zero and 50, right? They just said, look, we're going to do away with all of that. We're going to make people essentially equal because you have more people living common law than you do really have married these days. So why are we making a distinction between that? And that's why they changed the law last year. Okay. And that's both for division of assets and for spousal support? Uh, spousal support is, is, is a little bit different. That's more like, a, I describe it more like an art than a science because child support is more like a science. You know, you have X amount of income in the simplistic term. Uh, you have so many kids, it equates to so much per month on the tables, depending on what province you're in. Once you've accounted for the child support, then you deal with the spousal support. And that's where the art comes into it because we have spousal advisory guidelines that assist us in giving some ranges, but they're not law, they're a tool. We have to go back to the case law and find similar cases to yours with similar number of children or uh, income levels and find out what kind of uh, spousal support did they get? What kind of duration did they get? And we give all these suggestions to the hearing judge and the hearing judge is ultimately the one who's going to come up with some number. It could be my number, it could be opposing counsel's number, or it could be somewhere in, in between any of those. So there's no real science to spousal support, but spousal support comes from the Divorce Act, okay? And property comes from the Provincial Family Property Act. So different legislation, different jurisdictions. Perfect, that's very helpful, thanks. Wow. And yeah, I know the child support guidelines, that's like literally a table, right? It is, it is. And you can look them up online. I mean, they'll be very close when you look them up online, but we do have programs like ChildView, which we have in the office and they calculate all the tax benefits and things like that. So we're able to determine the exact number and if you have any extracurricular activities or daycare expenses, and they'll give you all the tax credits and benefits like that and spit out a global number. So those are very, very helpful programs. And they're kept up to date for us by the child view program people. Yes, that makes good sense. Now, uh, just going back to separation in Alberta, I'm going to mm -hmm. have a few questions about separation. Here. Sure. So what does somebody, you, you even mentioned this, you said, you know, some people are sort of casually separated, I think, was, and some people are like real full on, have gone through the process. So what does that gradation look like? Or what do people do to get themselves like actually separated? What do the courts need to see here? Well, the courts can take sort of an unofficial and official separation into account, okay? Let's talk about the unofficial, okay? You're not doing any kind of formal document. You've decided you're going to separate from your partner. You could be living in the same household, but you're not beholden to the other. You're making your own decisions. You're going on your own financial path. You're not telling them when you're back that day or where you're going. There's no joint family venture involved in that, okay? Or you could be, you know, one party moves out and you're living in separate residences, okay? So you're separate, but you haven't resolved all of your issues that you have, you know, child support, spousal support, property issues, debt issues. You've done none of that except decided you're going to separate, okay? And so you still have to go through that process of trying to get a resolution, either through mediation, through mediation arbitration, or through the court system, or yourselves, okay? If you're going to do a formal separation, though, that requires a separation agreement, or we sometimes call them minutes of settlement or uh, a separation contract, okay? You're making a decision with your ex-partner about all the myriad of issues that you have. You're committing them to paper. And then we go away, we sell homes, we transfer RSPs, we transfer funds, we pay debts off, all those kind of good things. That is really a legal separation document. And with that, you know completely that you're separated, you're done, your uh, connections between one another are completed as opposed to the unofficial separation where it's physical separation, but you still have all those issues left to be resolved. So that's the difference. How much can people resolve without going, like without professional advice here? Do you see people who actually sit down and are able to hammer out those issues or do people kind of leave a bunch of questions unanswered and then it rears its ugly head later on? 
Well, we often get a framework from people who try to do it themselves. And then we try to advise them on the law and the areas or the gaps that they have in their own document. And then for the things that we can't handle, we refer them over to accountants or financial planners to fill in the blanks and come back to us because you know we're just one tool in the toolbox. Everybody is, they have their little piece of knowledge. And sometimes we have to go to other experts as well to get the knowledge we need to finish the document. So you can't really do it yourself or you're gonna miss out on something. And six months, one year down the road, when you do get some proper advice, you're gonna go, holy cow, I really lost out. I lost out on a ton of money or entitlements or equalization or CPP equalization. I didn't know that I had the entitlement to. So spending even an hour with a lawyer or an hour with an accountant or a financial planner is worth its weight in gold to point you in the right direction to understand what you need to resolve in a way that is equitable for both parties. Uh, just talk me through the CPP entitlement thing for a moment here. It's a common mm -hmm. question that I get, and I know there's a, a legal entitlement to share CPP, mm -hmm. but CPP at the end, but mm -hmm. can you talk us through that? Well, you can have CPP equalization of CPP credits, okay? So everybody generates CPP credits during their lifetime based on you know their employment. They pay into it every year, okay? If you've had one partner who has worked out of the home more than the other and has had a higher level of employment, they're going to have a higher level of CPP credits. So at the end of the relationship, you can apply to have those equalized during the period of the relationship or the period of marriage. And it simply means a transfer the government makes from the higher party to the lower party to equalize those. You still get your CPP credits from pre-relationship. They're all yours. You still get to keep those but it's an equalization of the ones that were generated while you were together. It's a simple form to do actually. And you can do that, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you can do that if you were divorced years after the relationship ended, can't you? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. In fact, what happens is we send people their certificate of divorce and say, look, you know, go to link X or Y and fill out the form send a copy of your divorce judgment in and they'll do it and then however long it takes the government to do it they will do it though yeah. and just going back to separation so you had said here that you know sometimes you have just this very informal sometimes you've mediated sometimes it's gone to court do you find most people get mediated settlements today is that the, the most common no i wouldn't say that i would say that during COVID, that's probably increased because our courts were shut for a long time and we've got a backlog because they were shot and the focus on criminals at the moment also creates a backlog. So people have been looking for alternative ways of trying to resolve their disputes. So sometimes they will have used mediation for the past 18 months or so. Uh, I find generally not because, um, I don't know, it's just like the cost of mediation. It depends how you do it right? You can hire a mediator yourself and the two of you can go with a mediator and a partial person and get a deal done and then just briefly go to separate lawyers to get it signed. Or you can hire your lawyers to come with you to the mediation, which sometimes creates more expense because the lawyers want to do the job that they would do at court. So you're paying for the lawyer and you're paying for the mediator as well. So it can be expensive. When you go to court, yes, you have to wait to get into court, but you don't have to pay for the judge. You only have to pay for your lawyer, you see? Okay. So it's a kind of a cost benefit and time analysis. Do you want to wait more time to get into court and just pay for your lawyer? Or do you want to get the matter done quicker and maybe pay a little bit more at the front end? Everybody's a little bit different how they want to handle that. And I guess some of that would owe to the fact that you know, family law cases probably like if you think about civil litigation, you have many, many more hours of things like discovery, right? I'm assuming in family law cases, it's a little more I'm cut and dried the right word, but like you do that, that work all the time, right? Well, they're very, very similar because we do have discoveries as well. I do find though that family cases go on farther and take longer to resolve than civil cases oh, wow. simply because family is so emotionally charged. When it's a civil case, it's just a case of, did somebody do something right or wrong or do they owe a debt, okay? There's, there's a lack of emotion involved in those civil cases, but the emotion of breaking up the relationship or 
breaking the ties between one person and another and the fear of the future that might be involved in that for at least one of the parties causes these family law cases to sometimes go on for a number of years to get resolved. It's not unusual for a family case to take three or four years to get resolved if they are not invested in getting it done quickly. Do you find that it's both parties who aren't invested or is it just one party has to not be invested in it? causes? I that? think it's generally one party. I, I tend to find that there's one who's more rational than the other and wants to get it done, wants to move on, who's ready to move on, and the other one isn't. Right. So the emotions get in the way and they certainly do protract a lot. Three or four years seems like a terribly painful long time to deal with something like that. It, that it is. It is. Yeah. When you look at the time, but also keep in mind that court time, I can't get it right away. So I might file something today, but your hearing might be four months from now. So within that four month period, I might not be doing terribly much until you can get into court, have your day in court and have that issue resolved. So when you put it in that context, three to four years is not a lot of time in the court's life. It is in yours, but not in mine. Yes, I, I mean, that's fair. I guess it's all perspective. It still seems like a long time. I know. Um, now, what about requirements for CRA? And I know you don't do tax work specifically, but uh, do you have a sense of what CRA needs to yeah, say? Yeah, they, they, they don't this? really require a, a legal separation agreement to be signed. They simply require you to mark off on your taxes that you're separated. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, the financial institutions, however, will require one, particularly if you're going to be dealing with uh, one spouse buying the other spouse out of an interest in a, in a matrimonial home or a family home, because they will want to ensure that the person who's getting paid out has absolutely no claim on that property once it's refinanced. So they generally are the ones who will require it. Makes sense. And pensions as well. I would assume there's a relatively high bar with pensions for demonstrating end of relationship. Um, pensions are basically done by pension order. So you put them in a, a separation agreement that they're going to be equalized during the period of X to Y. Okay. And, and I say X to Y because we generally know when the relationship started, but sometimes the parties argue over when it ended. Okay, so there's a negotiation over the end date. So X to Y, whatever that means for you. Uh, will be the period of time they'll be equalized. So we generally put it in the agreement that it'll be done, but it's not actually completed until we do a court order that is signed off and stamped, and we can send that certified copy over to the pension administrator who will then do their thing and either keep it at source and divide it, or they'll carve it away and tell the other party, where do you want it locked in? Where are we sending it to? So there's really two parts to pension. Yeah, and that's one I know a lot of my students will find interesting, right? This uh, mm -hmm. division of pension assets. Now, what do you find the most contentious issues are? What do people fight about? What, what drags energy over that three or four years you talked about? Uh, probably parenting and child support more than spousal support. Yeah. Because a lot of people love their kids and they want their kids. And half time is never going to be enough time when they're used to being around them all the time. And then to be fair, and, and some people just want the kids because they get the child support. So there's a fight over that because they don't have enough money themselves to survive necessarily if they didn't get child support. And I, I'm sorry if that seems a little harsh, but I, I do find that a lot. So the biggest fights are over the parenting part how much time are they going to get with the kids? And then the corresponding, who is responsible for paying what amount of support to the other person? Those are the ones that will hold things up, at least initially. When you start to get past that block and you start to get onto other issues, sometimes those can end up being resolved a lot quicker. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting about the, and it makes sense, right? Child support, I mean, if you got two kids and a non-working person taking care of them. You're, you know, 12, 1500 bucks a month. Kids are easy, expensive. Right? Yeah, yeah, kids are expensive. And that's not even with the add-on section sevens, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a few minutes. Right. Uh, you could give a section seven right now. This is, I know, the uh, additional amounts for child support. Can you run down what happens with section seven? Absolutely. Um, so other than the table amounts that you pay, which are just based on, let's say, the payer's income for simplicity's sake, 
we have these things called section seven. So there are additional expenses that you pay in proportion to your income. So a simple way of thinking is if you make 60,000 and your partner makes 40, you're paying 60% of the net of those expenses. Okay, just in a simple sense. So the biggest ones are daycare, okay? Then we have medical or dental expenses over $100 a year, okay? So your 20% of your plan that's not covered, that's gonna be a section seven. Any medical or dental premiums you have through your company or you pay Alberta Blue Cross maybe for extra coverage, those premiums will be included. We're going to have uh, extraordinary extracurricular activities. So depending on your income, say um, soccer or hockey, the registration fee would not be a Section 7 because it's normal. But going to the camps or the tournaments might be because they're extraordinary. And then we have post-secondary expenses as well. That's a big one. So if you don't have RESPs to contribute to that, you're looking at what are the post-secondary tuition books and lab fees. Where is your child going to go? Are they going to stay in city or are they going to go to another city? So those are the kind of things that we look at and we shove them into those child view tables that I talked about earlier and come out with all the tax benefits to figure out what's the net. Okay, what does somebody have to pay to? So you have your section three based on your income and you have your section seven added together and globally they're called child support payments. Perfect. That makes uh, a lot of sense. I think that's a great explanation. Uh, you mentioned paying for a kid's schooling if there's not RESPs to fund that. How late are we paying child support today in Alberta? Well, you can really look at it to the end of first degree or diploma. Okay. Once they're around 18 years of age, if they are unable to remove themselves from the care and control of their parents, i.e. they're unable to support themselves, and that usually means while they're in school, then they will continue to be a child of marriage. And then once they've got their first degree or diploma, about a month or two after that, child support would get cut off. There are exceptionally rare circumstances where someone would get covered right through the end of a master's. And what about a child with a disability that would render them unable to ever care for themselves? Well, that's a little bit difficult because then we start to have age payments in Alberta taken into consideration. So a child that has a disability would have age. We would work out what is the budget for that child on a monthly basis? Is it being met by age? And then what obligation over and above that would another parent who's not the custodial parent have towards providing any potential top up to that child who has age? Okay, like a million moving parts to this child support thing when you get into There it. are, that's why everybody is different. Our family law is very fact dependent. Your factual circumstances applied with the law and the ability to give you some form of relief based on those circumstances. Now, you mentioned earlier bringing the accountant into this picture, the mm -hmm. financial advisor potentially as well. Um, is this a, a normal thing? Like, does everybody go see an accountant? And I know one of the things I hear is that people don't necessarily account for registered versus non-registered assets sort of on a, a net basis. How much do you get involved in that kind of conversation Depends on the net worth of the client and their circumstances. So if they're a high net worth, then yes, we will send them to the accountant. They already have an accountant. A lot of people don't. They go to H&R Block to get their taxes done. So they're, they're not the kind of person that we would send to an accountant or would have the money necessarily to consult with one. But people who have uh, their own company that they've got, whether it's uh, they're the only shareholder or they've got a couple shareholders and it's really the family business, we would definitely be sending them to an accountant uh, to get some advice about how to deal with the corporation and uh, what's the true value of that business. So we might be getting a business valuation done as well. So again, a lot of moving parts, depending on what your circumstance is and your net worth and your, I guess, familiarity with the process. I'm not going to send somebody to an accountant who's never gone to an accountant before. It's, it's useless. You know, but if they have a financial advisor at their bank, because they'd be dealing with somebody there, I say, go get some advice about this or that, and then come back and, and talk to me about it, right? Because hearing it from two people, giving the same sort of message really helps. I mean, I'm just a lawyer, okay? 
I can talk about these things. I can be right about a lot of the topics, but hearing it actually from the horse's mouth, from you know the financial advisor at the bank, really helps to cement that position that yes, they have confidence in where they're going and the direction they're taking. And I guess what would be the things that you would hope that that I mean, this is your chance, right? <laughs> what is that? What do you want that financial advisor? telling that client, like obviously not lying to them or anything like that, but what do you want the financial advisor communicating to it? Well, it depends on what stage you're at. Okay. Let's, let's say that, um, oh, um, you're wanting to get into a relationship. Okay. And you think that you're going to have an inheritance from the family. Okay. I would want them to talk to their financial advisor about keeping that money separate. Okay, they have to keep it in their own name, not put it in joint names, don't commingle it with other assets that they might have with their partner. Okay, because if one was to have a breakup, for example, we, we always plan for the worst and hope for the best in my business. But if you were to have a breakup, you would not want any portion of that money to go to the partner by way of our gift provisions. Okay, so if you can trace it, if an asset remains solely in that person's name, whether it changed from one investment to the other, it doesn't really matter. So long as we can trace it and track it, that it's never really become touched down in the other partner's financial portfolio or given to them, then that's a good thing for the client. Now, if they do want to give some money to that spouse or partner, I would want to have a discussion, perhaps even with their financial planner, with their permission about how we, we deal with that and what's their intention. Are they truly intending to give a gift of some of that money to the joint endeavor? Because they have to understand that some of that, if they do break up, will be considered matrimonial money or family money subject to division. Okay, so that's, that's very important for a financial planner to understand and not recommend, oh, well, let's shelter it over here and with the spouse or the partner for tax. Yeah, you might save some tax, but you might lose out rather largely at the end of the day because you made that decision. So that's very, very important to, to discuss with your financial planner. The other thing to discuss is, of course, having a uh, enduring power of attorney with your financial planner, something happens to your client, who's going to give you instructions about the portfolio, right? And so you need to know that as a financial planner and the person who is say in a coma in the hospital temporarily, they need to know that they've chosen somebody who can work with their financial planner and give them instructions so that they're keeping that wealth and that wealth being generated for them as well. So there's a number of different things depending on what's happening in your life that you want to talk to your financial planner about. Yeah, I, an example of the, the first thing you talked about, I mean, obviously powers of attorney, this is a huge part of what we talk about, mm -hmm. um, but then, using some of that, like getting an inheritance and paying down the mortgage with it, for example. That's one where I see people want to unwind that when the marriage breaks down. Yeah, and I, I because I do real estate, um, I have a, a different kind of perspective on things than people who just solely do real estate and yeah. don't do family law. The first question I ask people when they come in to buy their house is who's giving the down payment? And what is your intention with the down payment? And if the intention is that you are to keep that down payment no matter what, then I will structure the description of the title to make sure that you will always get that down payment back. And the remainder of it, the part that's being mortgaged that you're both contributing to and, and cutting down to zero, that part is what's shared. But unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues in the real estate bar, because they don't do family law, will just say, oh, you guys are living together, great, we'll put it in joint tenancy. And they never give consideration to, well, what's the end state here? What are we looking at with this big pile of cash from anywhere from $10,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars that somebody has given as a down payment? Are you getting that back? Or are you giving it sort of as a gift to this joint family venture you've got going on? So it's very important to have those kind of conversations. Yeah, I didn't even know that was possible to, to take steps oh, it, to preserve it, that. It is. And, and, and a lot of people, they don't see those titles. So I've had people argue with me, you can't do that. And then I'll hold up a copy of a land title and say, oh, yes, you can. Because <laughs> you know? I do it all the time. That's one of the, the questions I do ask because I'm cleaning up people's messes at the end of the day. They come to me at the back end. I'm like, oh, my gosh, 
you know, you didn't, you didn't put this in writing. I don't think I can get it for you. It would be so easy if you just had a 15 minute conversation with a lawyer or financial planner at the beginning. So easy. That's a great piece of advice. I think that that's one that uh, I'm sure a lot of people listening will pick up on that too and maybe put a little more diligence into what they tell their clients as far as uh, buying property as a couple. So yeah. yeah, I think it's very important just to realize that the issue is there and just say, you know, I think you should go and get some advice on that. It'd be worth its weight in gold just to get that advice and then you can circle around and come back to me. Right, so then you would go to the family lawyer typically for that, get that yes. breakdown and then go to the- um, Financial planner, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. for where the money is coming because the financial planner is gonna be assisting with cutting the check or the bank draft that's gonna to go to the lawyer who's gonna be doing that real estate transaction for sure. Yeah. That makes sense, Fiona. Thanks. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned quite a while ago the business assets, and I'm curious about business assets because I know this is kind of a fraught area in family law. What can you tell me about where you have one person in the household who owns a business? Well, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, I suppose we could start with some of the basics. When when you're selling a business. Um, you either have a, a sale of assets or you have a sale of shares, okay? So in family law, you have to avoid double dipping, okay? You can't say I'm going to take half the value of the assets in this corporation, plus I'm also going to take spousal support off the income that you're making from that corporation, okay? Often, though, I have to be honest, um, family-owned businesses don't have a ton of assets. It's generally the, the person who's operating in the business and, and through their efforts generating income, that's where the value is. So often we're not having to deal with that problem. It comes up, but not often. Uh, we're often just dealing with what is the value of the income that the person should be taking out of the business? And what is that value that should be determined for the purposes of calculating child or spousal support? We look at whether someone has kept a high level of worth in their corporate bank account for no reason, essentially trying to hide assets from the other spouse, and whether or not we should be attributing a higher level of income as if they did give themselves the money to determine what their income is for the purposes of those calculations. So would you be using the financial statements of the business as your primary we, we do. Yeah, we certainly do because we have disclosure requirements in family law. We call them a notice to disclose desk application and their items one through 16. So you have to disclose your tax returns, your notices of assessment, your uh, pay statements, uh, whether you got EI, things like that, uh, any pensions, uh, bank account statements, um, credit card statements, financial statements from any uh, business that you own more than 1% in and any exemptions and the statement of property assets and debt. So it's quite an exhaustive list. And we go through these things to see, well, you know, is that person running a business writing off meals for CRA, but they're the one eating them. And therefore we should be adding more income to their stated income on their personal tax returns. So we do an analysis of all the things that legally for CRA, they're not breaking any laws. CRA allows them to do that. But for family law purposes, you're not allowed to do that. So say you're writing off your home business space for CRA. Well, that's kind of a, a fake write-off, okay? You got the room anyway, right? It's not like you're renting the room. So we would take that amount and add it back to your income. We would top your income up for trying try to find out what your true income is. Right. Yeah, all, all my uh, tax-loving clients are going to be wincing at your description of that as a fake I know, because I'm just, I'm just looking at you sitting at home yeah. there with your bookcase and thinking, you know, yeah. there's a perfect example, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, home office deduction right here. There you exactly. go. Uh, now, an asset that does have a ton of assets in it is the family farm. So yes. what happens here where you've got something like that? Well, it depends how you got the family farm. Now, you may have inherited the family farm. So if you inherited the family farm and say you get into a relationship, the value of the family farm when you got into the relationship is going to be exempt. It's a pre-relationship, pre-marriage asset, okay? We have to look at what's the value of the family farm when you split. And that's where some of the wiggle room happens in the Family Property Act. 
do we take the increase in value and divide it in half, yes or no? And there's some ways of looking at the relationship to see like what are the contributions and whatnot of the, the parties to that and should it be half or less than half, okay? So if, if you've got it that way, then you're at least looking at a large portion of value for sure that is gonna be retained. The question then becomes and the argument is over that increase in value, okay? Some clients take the family farm and long before they get in a relationship, they put it into a corporation and it's the corporation that has shares and then shares are getting left to other people in their will. So there's different ways of doing planning for family farms. And that's where financial planners come into the whole role to assist us in what is the best way of sheltering the value to that person who owns it. Uh, or what is their intention? Maybe they say, clearly my intention is that I want my spouse, if we you know, have survived 20 years of marriage, to be able to share in that. So maybe they do a prenuptial agreement that we talked about earlier that says, hey, you're gonna get so much value out of the family farm uh, at the end of the day, should we split? So again, it's very fact dependent as is so much in family law. What do you want? What do you have? And what's your intention? And so how do we get you to that intention at the end of the day? Makes sense. Now, is there anything else, any other assets or financial considerations that you find create particular challenges here that we should talk about, Fiona? Um, not so much a challenge. I think the biggest challenge is trying to determine what you have and, and what your debts are. What is the value? The the argument becomes over the value of things. So for example, matrimonial homes or family homes, I generally recommend that they get appraisals because you can't rely on the city's tax assessed value, okay? It's, it, it has no bearing on reality. And then the question is how much does, is that property worth? You're gonna have a little bit of a battle of those experts because of course one party wants it to be higher so they can get a higher payout, okay? The question is then also, as I mentioned earlier, what's the end date on this relationship? Because the longer the end date is, the more potential entitlement you have to a larger share of, of assets and value, right? You think you're going to see some of that question coming out of COVID where people are going to say like, we actually separated like in February of 20 or I guess April of 2020. And we just didn't have a choice. We couldn't move out because of COVID or whatever. So like, do you think you're going to have this like year of question about what the separation dates were? I, I think you will for some people because they were locked into their houses. They had no opportunity to leave, to go somewhere, you know, to go to a hotel and stay there. Things just generally weren't considered safe. This year they do. So this year, more than any year, you're starting to see them come out of the woodwork and decide they're going to move forward with whatever stage in their life they're at. So you're generally going to have a dispute over that. When is the end date? And someone's going to say, well, I didn't know we were separated. You never told me, right? And, and so that, that's the big argument that happens. So a lot of it is over what's that end date, because that end date is directly attributable to value. The second argument that we really have is over debts. So someone has a high credit card debt or many credit cards you didn't know about. So you started separating and exchanging this disclosure, right? Surprise, someone's got six credit cards you didn't know about. So we have to look at the credit cards. Were they used for the purposes of the joint family venture? Or were they used for the uh, person you have on the side that you're seeing and you spent, you know, the wine woman and song, so to speak, and they had absolutely nothing to do with your relationship. Therefore, that debt should be yours and yours alone. So we pick through all of these kinds of things we pick through to see, has somebody been committing legal waste of assets? They're a gambler, we didn't know about it. And suddenly they've been pilfering away investments and value from the family. And shouldn't that come out of their part? So we sometimes have arguments over legal waste as well. That's, I'm sure that, that has to be a really difficult conversation sometimes, right? That's it is, and it's a long time to pick through it. So then you have to have the cost benefit analysis of what do you think the waste is worth versus how much you're gonna pay your lawyer and the time to try and prove the waste. And what are you gonna get out of it at the end of the day? 
the value minus your lawyer's fees is equal to what? Is it really worth it to go ahead? Sometimes people have lots of entitlements to things, but the cost of getting the entitlement isn't worth pursuing it. How, and maybe this is uh, not a question, sorry, that I prepared you well for here, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, how much of your job is like a counseling job and how much of it is technical? A lot of it is counseling. We have to be extremely patient with people and we have to try and divert them to the people that they can speak to because we don't have those qualifications. I mean, we're lawyers. We don't take any kind of counseling courses when we go through law school. We don't take them afterwards. Uh, we are not qualified to deal with the people's emotions. And in fact, in my practice, I take all of the emotion out of the documents that the clients give me when they give me their narratives so that I can present a legal position to the court because they don't want to hear it either. They want you to go to the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the counselor, the social worker. They want you to go to those tools and services. So we spend a lot of our time trying to redirect clients in that direction once we sort of take them off the ledge that they're on at the time uh, so that they can get some help. But to realize that in getting that help, we're not saying that they're crazy or they're mentally unstable. We're just saying that you know they're having a tough time in their lives and, and we're not the person to really help them with that, but we, we know some people who can. So it, it's hard. And if you can't deal with a client and, and they just want to deal, deal with the emotion and send you 15 emails a day kind of thing, then unfortunately we get rid of them in my practice because we're not dealing with the law and we're not here to be your sounding board. Your friends are and your counselors are, and we can't move you forward because you don't want to listen. That's uh, yeah, that's a good answer, and I know it's nice to be able to put that. I think uh, sort of like business wrapping around it, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here for this job. Now, on that note, and I know this is a question that there's never going to be a great answer for, but can you give a rough idea? Like, what does it, what should it cost somebody to go through the various <laughs> processes associated with the the family law stuff, like the family law 101 you gave us at the beginning? Do you have well, any comfortable I, I, answer? I, I kind of smile about that and I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but let me sort of give you a, a basic understanding of how the cost structure works, okay? The lawyers that you pick are not setting their hourly rates based on anything set by the law society or any legislation. The lawyers pick their own hourly rates and they sort of do so based on their number of years at the bar, uh, their perceived level of experience, okay? because everyone has their own egos and, and where they practice quite honestly. So if you're in a bigger firm and you have a higher overhead and lovely paintings on the wall, you're going to pay more than you go to a smaller firm that doesn't. Okay. They might be equally competent lawyers, but quite honestly, you're going to pay more at the bigger firms. Okay. So in picking a lawyer, you have to go out just like you would with your doctor or your dentist and find somebody that you're comfortable with. Okay. You might have to go through two or three lawyers and go and have a consult to find somebody you can work with. That's number one. Number two is finding out what their hourly rate is and having shopped around a little bit, you know, for someone of comparable years at the bar doing what they're doing, does that seem reasonable or not? Okay. You're the one who picks the lawyer. You're the one who picks the fee. Okay. And then you're going to sign a retainer agreement. And those lawyers are going to have a different retainer to start to get gas in the tank to get your matter going. Okay, so that's sort of the, the basic for where you start from. After that, um, I describe it sort of like a football game, because that's the way most people can understand. You've got the ball and you've got a plan to get to the end zone. Unfortunately, it is not a direct line. Okay. You're going to start with your plan and something's going to interrupt you. That's going to be the other party with a response or with a counter application. OK, so it's kind of like taking two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So eventually you chip through all your issues and you get to the end zone and you're all done. OK, that can take anywhere between, as I say, now to say three, four years, depending on the complexity of your matter and the emotional state the other person's applications they're going to bring as well to get everything done, okay? And if you have to go through the court system, you are also dealing with scheduling your matter for a hearing. 
And you can't just say, hey, I want to get in next week because the court may not have time next week. And realistically, with COVID, everything's being delayed and being pushed to the right. Okay, so you're getting a little bit longer to get in to get a hearing. Unless you go through mediation or mediation arbitration, you can get in faster because, again, you're picking somebody and you're setting up a schedule which is faster than the court, hopefully, uh, to get in and get a resolution, get somebody to help you. Okay. So it can be very costly if you're the one who's committed to the process and the other party isn't. If you're both committed to the process to get it done, I've done things from start to finish for clients within a period of three months, right? That's how quickly it can be done. If both are invested in, let's get all our issues on the table, let's hash through them, get them done, get them in an agreement or an order or a judgment, it can be three months. Okay. okay. If you're going to fight over it, it's, it could be years. And therefore, your expense goes up. And you don't have to sacrifice fairness to get that three months, right? Like that can be done in a fair way or... Well, I don't use the word fair because that's very fair. subjective. Okay. Yes. You may never think the process that you go through in the end result is fair. Okay. Because fair to you means almost that you get everything that you want. Okay. I say equitable. Yeah. Okay, whatever the law provides for, if the law provides for it, I am going to fight to get what the law provides for you. If you want to make a slight compromise here or there to get something done faster, that's up to you, but you do it with your eyes wide open with all the tools and options in front of you, and you make that decision. And then it becomes something you can live with. So it's not a win, it's not a loss, something you can live with and you can move on. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I like that packaging again. Now, you had obviously prepared some uh, thoughts earlier about what you kind of wish financial planners would talk to their clients about. I thought that was really valuable. Um, are there cases you've seen where you wish that you had seen a client sooner, where you feel like somebody should have sent that client to see you before something blew up or before it got expensive? Um, lots of cases. Um... I think sometimes lawyers don't do the best job of managing expectations of clients. They have to do that from day one when they see them because clients are going to come in and they have an impression of what happened with their friend or what they saw on television, which is often American television and it's wrong. And we have to set the expectations right from the get go. And I think a lot of lawyers come in and client has a whole host of issues and they just say, okay, I'm going to fight through it and, and not really tune them in to where they should be thinking and where Canada allows them to go with their legal matter. So I think getting in the beginning and setting those expectations firstly is key. Okay. Because I do a lot of cleanup on files. I get that other lawyers have had and they've made a right muck of it because they didn't properly advise them on topic A or topic B. And I, I don't take on too many of them because they're very emotionally draining for me to, to deal with going through them, but I don't want things to get to that state. So for me, it's expectations. I also mentioned the real estate. I want that real estate fixed from the get-go if I possibly can, because later on, I may not be able to fix it for you despite my best efforts. And you may lose out thousands and thousands of dollars that you didn't intend. So that's really key too, okay? And then also dealing with, you know, stopping your relationship. If you're stopping your relationship, one of the, the easiest ways to say when the end date is, is you give someone an email or a text saying it's over. Right? I mean, it's as simple as that. And then we know when it was definitely over. There's no arguing over that end date. And so then you are cutting off an entitlement to uh, funds and things generated after that end date, you see? So there are a number of things like that that I wish that people would deal with uh, a lot easier or sooner with me or other lawyers at the bar for that matter. Now, I'm assuming if I send that text saying it's over and then I'm back the next day, like on the front doorstep asking to be taken back, like does that, that kind of throws that out, doesn't it? Well, that throws that out for sure. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're, you've got to mean it, right? Yeah. Can't yeah. say it, it's over and then it's just not over for an hour and then I'm back. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, I've but if it's clearly exactly. over, say that it's over and then follow up with, as per you know our, our discussion at Tim's this afternoon, I, I don't feel I can be together with you anymore and, and we've got to separate. So I'm going to proceed with that, right? So it can be something nice. It doesn't have to be harsh, right, right. right? But something that I can use to show the court that it clearly was over on X number of date and uh, I can run with that and help to deal with your division as of that time period. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've been great, Fiona. I feel like you've really given us just a ton to uh, chew on here. You've given the, the how does it work, some real nuts and bolts stuff, and I really appreciate that. You obviously thought about some of the answers you wanted to give beforehand. Is there any last minute thoughts you have for us, Fiona, or do you feel like you got everything you wanted to say out there? Well, I think I, I would probably say to everybody, um, try to get those personal directives and enduring powers of attorney done for your clients, okay? exceptionally good tools to have in Alberta, okay? Talk to them about what their intentions are with their money when they're talking about trying to maybe give something to a spouse or a partner, that's, that's key, okay? And also try to save them some money. So refer them to a lawyer for a consult. They don't have to hire the lawyer to solve the problem yet, but get some information because knowledge is powerful, right? So refer them to lawyer for that. And then also suggest perhaps they want to consider mediation arbitration as well. Because if they can get invested in that in the get-go, they can potentially save themselves a lot of money. And the whole intent of all of this is if you're having people that are separating, you want to maximize the amount of money that ends up coming out to your client at the end of the day. So I think that's really key to push them in that direction. That's the way the court's going to try and declog the court system and get people through faster. I think that's the way that we should be responsibly thinking about moving our clients forward. Um, and just sort of be aware of some of these issues that we've talked about today. You've got them in the back of your mind and say to your clients, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about that? And who is it that you might wanna think about talking to to get some answers? Lawyers don't have the all, the all the answers. We have an idea of where to get the answers often and uh, stay in your lane. Like give your financial advice, but farm people out. We do the same thing. We stay in our lane and farm them out to people to get the best advice to circle around and help us. And I, I think that's really important consideration to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that team approach is a must. That's certainly an important part of how I've always taught financial planning. So absolutely, we're we're not an island, and we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't act that way. We're all working for our clients' best interests, and we have to do that collectively. And of course, you talk about that consultation. You'll be more than happy if people reach out to you with questions after the episode. Oh yeah, I mean, in my office, I mean, we're not all the same as lawyers, but in my office, we do a free fifteen minute consult with people to sort of get them started. And then if they like what they hear or they like us, they can circle around and have a more in-depth consult or retain us. I would also talk to clients that have businesses where they're in with business partners, consider things like unanimous shareholders agreements, okay, to protect who is going to come into your business uh, with you to operate it while it's a going concern. And also those USAs may prevent some distribution of marital assets uh, on breakup of one or more of those business partners that you have. So talking to a lawyer about that as well, I think is also key. Yeah, something we haven't talked about. We've had powers of attorney and personal directives on the podcast, but we actually haven't had USAs yet, mm -hmm. but we will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, all right. That's wonderful. I hope that that was uh, edu educational for everybody listening. And uh, again, thanks so much, Fiona. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. All right, you can hear in the interview there the extent to which Fiona knows her stuff. She is absolutely an expert, and that's, I think, what we need on our side when we're getting into these family law questions. The number for today's episode is nine. The number for today's episode is nine. I hope you'll join us again in two weeks when I'll have uh, Trevor Schoenwall from Moncury, which is an interesting uh, financial education app. So maybe download the app, give it a try, and then you'll be prepared to listen to Trevor's interview. That's uh, Mon Kiri. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks very much for joining us. 
you'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner, and from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Rennie Wong, and Sushami Pamela-Paquet are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals.